dangerously ill. Suddenly, birds come out of her skin and cover her completely. Twelve. Swarms of gnats obscure the sun, the moon, and all the stars except one. That one star falls upon the dreamer. In the unabridged German original, each dream begins with the words of the old fairy tale, Once Upon a Time. By these words, the little dreamer suggests that she feels as if each dream were a sort of fairy tale, which she wants to tell her father as a Christmas present. The father tried to explain the dreams in terms of their context, but he could not do so, for there seemed to be no personal associations to them. The possibility that these dreams were conscious elaborations can, of course, be ruled out only by someone who knew the child well enough to be absolutely sure of her truthfulness. They would, however, remain a challenge to our understanding even if they were fantasies. In this case, the father was convinced that the dreams were authentic, and I have no reason to doubt it. I knew the little girl myself, but this was before she gave her dreams to her father, so that I had no chance to ask her about them. She lived abroad and died of an infectious disease about a year after that Christmas. Her dreams have a decidedly peculiar character. Their leading thoughts are markedly philosophic in concept. The first one, for instance, speaks of an evil monster killing other animals, but God gives rebirth to them all through a divine apocatastasis or restitution. In the Western world, this idea is known through the Christian tradition. It can be found in the Acts of the Apostles, 321, Christ whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things. The early Greek fathers of the church, for instance Origen, particularly insisted upon the idea that at the end of time everything will be restored by the Redeemer to its original and perfect state. But according to St. Matthew, 1711, there was already an old Jewish tradition that Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. 1 Corinthians 15.22 refers to the same idea in the following words, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. One might guess that the child had encountered this thought in her religious education, but she had very little religious background. Her parents were Protestants in name, but in fact they knew the Bible only from hearsay. It is particularly unlikely that the recondite image of apocatastasis had been fully explained to the girl. Certainly her father had never heard of this mythical idea. Nine of the twelve dreams are influenced by the theme of destruction and restoration, and none of these dreams shows traces of specific Christian education or influence. On the contrary, they are more closely related to primitive myths. This relation is corroborated by the other motif, the cosmogonic myth the creation of the world and of man, that appears in the fourth and fifth dreams. The same connection is found in 1 Corinthians 15.22, which I have just quoted. In this passage, too, Adam and Christ, death and resurrection, are linked together. The general idea of Christ the Redeemer belongs to the worldwide and pre-Christ theme of the hero and rescuer, who, although he has been devoured by a monster, appears again in a miraculous way, having overcome whatever monster it was that swallowed him. When and where such a motif originated, nobody knows. We do not even know how to go about investigating the problem. The one apparent certainty is that every generation seems to have known it as a tradition handed down from some preceding time. Thus we can safely assume that it originated at a period when man did not yet know that he possessed a hero myth. In an age, that is to say, when he did not yet consciously reflect on what he was saying, the hero figure is an archetype which has existed since time immemorial. The production of archetypes by children is especially significant because one can sometimes be quite certain that a child has had no direct access to the tradition concerned. In this case, the girl's family had no more than a superficial acquaintance with the Christian tradition. Christian themes may, of course, be represented by such ideas as God, angels, heaven, hell, and evil, but the way in which they are treated by this child points to a totally non-Christian origin. Let us take the first dream of the God who really consists of four gods coming from the four corners. The corners of what? There is no room mentioned in the dream. A room would not even fit in with the picture of what is obviously a cosmic event in which the universal being himself intervenes. The quaternity, or element of foreness itself, is a strange idea, 
but one that plays a great role in many religions and philosophies. In the Christian religion, it has been superseded by the Trinity, a notion that we must assume was known to the child. But who in an ordinary middle-class family of today would be likely to know of a divine quaternity? It is an idea that was once fairly familiar among students of the Hermetic philosophy in the Middle Ages, but it petered out with the beginning of the 18th century, and it has been entirely obsolete for at least 200 years. Where, then, did the little girl pick it up? From Ezekiel's vision? But there is no Christian teaching that identifies the seraphim with God. The same question may be asked about the horned serpent. In the Bible, it is true, there are many horned animals, in the book of Revelation, for instance. But all these seem to be quadruped, although their overlord is the dragon, the Greek word for which, dracon, also means serpent. The horned serpent appears in 16th century Latin alchemy as the quadricornutus serpens, four-horned serpent, a symbol of Mercury and an antagonist of the Christian trinity. But this is an obscure reference. So far as I can discover, it is made by only one author, and this child had no means of knowing it. In the second dream, a motif appears that is definitely non-Christian and that contains a reversal of accepted values, for instance, pagan dances by men in heaven and good deeds by angels in hell. This symbol suggests a relativity of moral values. Where did the child find such a revolutionary notion, worthy of Nietzsche's genius? These questions lead us to another. What is the compensatory meaning of these dreams, to which the little girl obviously attributed so much importance that she presented them to her father as a Christmas present? If the dreamer had been a primitive medicine man, one could reasonably assume that they represent variations of the philosophical themes of death, of resurrection or restitution, of the origin of the world, the creation of man, and the relativity of values but one might give up such dreams as hopelessly difficult if one tried to interpret them from a personal level. They undoubtedly contain collective images, and they are in a way analogous to the doctrines taught to young people in primitive tribes when they are about to be initiated as men. At such times they learn about what God or the gods or the founding animals have done, how the world and man were created, how the end of the world will come, and the meaning of death. Is there any occasion when we, in Christian civilization, hand out similar instructions? There is, in adolescence. But many people begin to think again of things like this in old age, at the approach of death. The little girl, as it happened, was in both these situations. She was approaching puberty and, at the same time, the end of her life. Little or nothing in the symbolism of her dreams points to the beginning of a normal adult life, but there are many allusions to destruction and restoration. When I first read her dreams, indeed, I had the uncanny feeling that they suggested impending disaster. The reason I felt like that was the peculiar nature of the compensation that I deduced from the symbolism. It was the opposite of what one would expect to find in the consciousness of a girl of that age. These dreams open up a new and rather terrifying aspect of life and death. One would expect to find such images in an aging person who looks back upon life, rather than to be given them by a child who would normally be looking forward. Their atmosphere recalls the old Roman saying, Life is a short dream, rather than the joy and exuberance of its springtime. For this child's life was like a ver sacrum vovendum, vow of a vernal sacrifice, as the Roman poet puts it. Experience shows that the unknown approach of death casts an adumbratio, an anticipatory shadow over the life and dreams of the victim. Even the altar in Christian churches represents, on the one hand, a tomb, and, on the other, a place of resurrection, the transformation of death into eternal life. Such are the ideas that the dreams brought home to the child. They were a preparation for death, expressed through short stories, like the tales told at primitive initiations or the koans of Zen Buddhism. This message is unlike the orthodox Christian doctrine and more like ancient primitive thought. It seems to have originated outside historical tradition in the long-forgotten psychic sources that since prehistoric times have nourished philosophical and religious speculation about life and death. It was as if future events were casting their shadow back by arousing in the child certain thought forms that, though normally dormant, 
describe or accompany the approach of a fatal issue, although the specific shape in which they express themselves is more or less personal. Their general pattern is collective. They are found everywhere and at all times, just as animal instincts vary a good deal in the different species, and yet serve the same general purposes. We do not assume that each newborn animal creates its own instincts as an individual acquisition, and we must not suppose that human individuals invent their specific human ways with every new birth. Like the instincts, the collective thought patterns of the human mind are innate and inherited. They function when the occasion arises in more or less the same way in all of us. Emotional manifestations to which such thought patterns belong are recognizably the same all over the earth. We can identify them even in animals, and the animals themselves understand one another in this respect, even though they may belong to different species. And what about insects with their complicated symbiotic functions? Most of them do not even know their parents and have nobody to teach them. Why should one assume then that man is the only living being deprived of specific instincts, or that his psyche is devoid of all traces of its evolution? Naturally, if you identify the psyche with consciousness, you can easily fall into the erroneous idea that man comes into the world with a psyche that is empty, and that in later years it contains nothing more than what it has learned by individual experience. But the psyche is more than consciousness. Animals have little consciousness, but many impulses and reactions that denote the existence of a psyche, and primitives do a lot of things whose meaning is unknown to them. You may ask many civilized people in vain for the real meaning of the Christmas tree or of the Easter egg. The fact is, they do things without knowing why they do them. I am inclined to the view that things were generally done first, and that it was only a long time afterward that somebody asked why they were done. The medical psychologist is constantly confronted with otherwise intelligent patients who behave in a peculiar and unpredictable way, and who have no inkling of what they say or do. They are suddenly caught by unreasonable moods for which they themselves cannot account. Superficially, such reactions and impulses seem to be of an intimately personal nature, and so we dismiss them as idiosyncratic behavior. In fact, they are based upon a preformed and ever-ready instinctive system that is characteristic of man. Thought forms, universally understandable gestures, and many attitudes. Follow a pattern that was established long before man developed a reflective consciousness. It is even conceivable that the early origins of man's capacity to reflect come from the painful consequences of violent emotional clashes. Let me take purely as an illustration of this point the bushman who, in a moment of anger and disappointment at his failure to catch any fish, strangles his much beloved only son, and is then seized with immense regret as he holds the little dead body in his arms. Such a man might remember this moment of pain forever. We cannot know whether this kind of experience was actually the initial cause of the development of human consciousness, but there is no doubt that the shock of a similar emotional experience is often needed to make people wake up and pay attention to what they are doing. There is a famous case of a 13th-century Spanish hidalgo, Ramon Lull, who finally, after a long chase. Succeeded in meeting the lady he admired at a secret rendezvous. She silently opened her dress and showed him her breast, rotten with cancer. The shock changed Lul's life. He eventually became an eminent theologian and one of the church's greatest missionaries. In the case of such a sudden change, one can often prove that an archetype has been at work for a long time in the unconscious, skillfully arranging circumstances that will lead to the crisis. Such experiences seem to show that archetypal forms are not just static patterns; they are dynamic factors that manifest themselves in impulses, just as spontaneously as the instincts. Certain dreams, visions, or thoughts can suddenly appear, and however carefully one investigates, one cannot find out what causes them. This does not mean that they have no cause; they certainly have, but it is so remote or obscure that one cannot see what it is. In such a case, one must wait either until the dream and its meaning are sufficiently understood, or until some external event occurs that will explain the dream. At the moment of the dream, this event may still lie in the future, but just as our conscious thoughts often occupy themselves with the future and its possibilities, 
so do the unconscious and its dreams. There has long been a general belief that the chief function of dreams is prognostication of the future. In antiquity, and as late as the Middle Ages, dreams played their part in medical prognosis. I can confirm by a modern dream the element of prognosis or precognition that can be found in an old dream quoted by Artemidorus of Daldus in the 2nd century A.D. A man dreamed that he saw his father die in the flames of a house on fire. Not long afterwards, he himself died in a phlegmony, fire or high fever, which I presume was pneumonia. It so happened that a colleague of mine was once suffering from a deadly gangrenous fever, in fact, a phlegmony. A former patient of his, who had no knowledge of the nature of his doctor's illness, dreamed that the doctor died in a great fire. At that time, the doctor had just entered a hospital, and the disease was only beginning. The dreamer knew nothing but the bare fact that his doctor was ill and in a hospital. Three weeks later, the doctor died. As this example shows, dreams may have an anticipatory or prognostic aspect, and anybody trying to interpret them must take this into consideration, especially where an obviously meaningful dream does not provide a context sufficient to explain it. Such a dream often comes right out of the blue, and one wonders what could have prompted it. Of course, if one knew its ulterior message, its cause would be clear, for it is only our consciousness that does not yet know. The unconscious seems already informed and to have come to a conclusion that is expressed in the dream. In fact, the unconscious seems to be able to examine and to draw conclusions from facts, much as consciousness does. It can even use certain facts and anticipate their possible results just because we are not conscious of them. But as far as one can make out from dreams, the unconscious makes its deliberations instinctively. The distinction is important. Logical analysis is the prerogative of consciousness. We select with reason and knowledge. The unconscious, however, seems to be guided chiefly by instinctive trends, represented by corresponding thought forms, that is, by the archetypes. A doctor who is asked to describe the course of an illness will use such rational concepts as infection or fever. The dream is more poetic. It presents the diseased body as a man's earthly house, and the fever as the fire that is destroying it. As the above dream shows, the archetypal mind has handled the situation in the same way as it did in the time of Artemidorus. Something that is of a more or less unknown nature has been intuitively grasped by the unconscious and submitted to an archetypal treatment. This suggests that instead of process of reasoning that conscious thought would have applied, the archetypal mind has stepped in and taken over the task of prognostication. The archetypes thus have their own initiative and their own specific energy. These powers enable them both to produce a meaningful interpretation in their own symbolic style and to interfere in a given situation with their own impulses and their own thought formations. In this respect, they function like complexes. They come and go very much as they please, and often they obstruct or modify our conscious intentions in an embarrassing way. We can perceive the specific energy of archetypes when we experience the peculiar fascination that accompanies them. They seem to hold a special spell. Such a peculiar quality is also characteristic of the personal complexes, and just as personal complexes have their individual history, so do social complexes of an archetypal character. But while personal complexes never produce more than a personal bias, archetypes create myths, religions, and philosophies that influence and characterize whole nations and epochs of history. We regard the personal complexes as compensations for one-sided or faulty attitudes of consciousness. In the same way, myths of a religious nature can be interpreted as a sort of mental therapy for the sufferings and anxieties of mankind in general, hunger, war, disease, old age, death. The universal hero myth, for example, always refers to a powerful man or god-man who vanquishes evil in the form of dragons, serpents, monsters, demons, and so on, and who liberates his people from destruction and death. The narration or ritual repetition of sacred texts and ceremonies and the worship of such a figure with dances, music, hymns, prayers, and sacrifices grip the audience with numinous emotions as if with magic spells, and exalt the individual to an identification with the hero. 
If we try to see such a situation with the eyes of a believer, we can perhaps understand how the ordinary man can be liberated from his personal impotence and misery and endowed, at least temporarily, with an almost superhuman quality. Often enough, such a conviction will sustain him for a long time and give a certain style to his life. It may even set the tone of a whole society. A remarkable instance of this can be found in the Eleusinian mysteries, which were finally suppressed at the beginning of the seventh century of the Christian era. They expressed, together with the Delphic oracle, the essence and spirit of ancient Greece. On a much greater scale, the Christian era itself owes its name and significance to the antique mystery of the God-man, which has its roots in the archetypal Osiris Horus myth of ancient Egypt. It is commonly assumed that on some given occasion in prehistoric times, the basic mythological ideas were invented by a clever old philosopher or prophet and ever afterward believed by a credulous and uncritical people. It is said that stories told by a power-seeking priesthood are not true, but merely wishful thinking. But the very word invent is derived from the Latin invenire, and means to find and hence to find something by seeking it. In the latter case, the word itself hints at some foreknowledge of what you are going to find. Let me go back to the strange ideas contained in the dreams of the little girl. It seems unlikely that she sought them out, since she was surprised to find them. They occurred to her rather as peculiar and unexpected stories, which seemed noteworthy enough to be given to her father as a Christmas present. In doing so, however, she lifted them up into the sphere of our still-living Christian mystery, the birth of our Lord, mixed with the secret of the evergreen tree that carries the newborn light. This is the reference of the fifth dream. Although there is ample historical evidence for the symbolic relation between Christ and the tree symbol, the little girl's parents would have been gravely embarrassed had they been asked to explain exactly what they meant by decorating a tree with burning candles to celebrate the nativity of Christ. Oh, it's just a Christmas custom, they would have said. A serious answer would require a far-reaching dissertation about the antique symbolism of the dying God and its relation to the cult of the Great Mother and her symbol, the tree, to mention only one aspect of this complicated problem. The further we delve into the origins of a collective image, or, to express it in ecclesiastical language, of a dogma, the more we uncover a seemingly unending web of archetypal patterns that before modern times were never the object of conscious reflection. Thus, paradoxically enough, we know more about mythological symbolism than did any generation before our own. The fact is that in former times men did not reflect upon their symbols. They lived them and were unconsciously animated by their meaning. I will illustrate this by an experience I once had with the primitives of Mount Elgon in Africa. Every morning at dawn they leave their huts and breathe or spit into their hands, which they then stretch out to the first rays of the sun, as if they were offering either their breath or their spittle to the rising god, to Mungu. This Swahili word, which they used in explaining the ritual act, is derived from a Polynesian root, equivalent to mana or molungu. These and similar terms designate a power of extraordinary efficiency and pervasiveness which we should call divine. Thus the word mungu is their equivalent for Allah or God. When I asked them what they meant by this act, or why they did it, they were completely baffled. They could only say, we have always done it. It has always been done when the sun rises. They laughed at the obvious conclusion that the sun is mungu. The sun indeed is not mungu when it is above the horizon. Mungu is the actual moment of the sunrise. What they were doing was obvious to me, but not to them. They just did it, never reflecting on what they did. They were consequently unable to explain themselves. I concluded that they were offering their souls to Mungu because the breath of life and the spittle meant soul substance. To breathe or spit upon something conveys a magical effect, as for instance when Christ used spittle to cure the blind, or where a son inhales his dying father's last breath in order to take over the father's soul. It is most unlikely that these Africans ever, even in the remote past, knew any more about the meaning of their ceremony. In fact, their ancestors probably knew even less, because they were even more profoundly unconscious of their motives 
and thought less about their doings. Goethe's Faust aptly says, Im Anfang war die Tat, in the beginning was the deed. Deeds were never invented, they were done. Thoughts, on the other hand, are a relatively late discovery of man. First he was moved to deeds by unconscious factors. It was only a long time afterward that he began to reflect upon causes that had moved him, and it took him a very long time indeed to arrive at the preposterous idea that he must have moved himself, his mind being unable to identify any other motivating force than his own. We should laugh at the idea of a plant or an animal inventing itself, yet there are many people who believe that the psyche or mind invented itself, and thus was the creator of its own existence. As a matter of fact, the mind has grown to its present state of consciousness as an acorn grows into an oak, or as saurians developed into mammals. As it has for so long been developing, so it still develops, and thus we are moved by forces from within as well as by stimuli from without. These inner motives spring from a deep source that is not made by consciousness and is not under its control. In the mythology of earlier times, these forces were called mana, or spirits, demons, and gods. They are as active today as they ever were. If they conform to our wishes, we call them happy hunches, or impulses, and pat ourselves on the back for being smart fellows. If they go against us, then we say that it is just bad luck, or that certain people are against us, or that the cause of our misfortunes must be pathological. The one thing we refuse to admit is that we are dependent upon powers that are beyond our control. It is true, however, that in recent times civilized man has acquired a certain amount of willpower, which he can apply where he pleases. He has learned to do his work efficiently without having recourse to chanting and drumming to hypnotize him into a state of doing. He can even dispense with a daily prayer for divine aid. He can carry out what he proposes to do and he can apparently translate his ideas into action without a hitch, whereas the primitive seems to be hampered at each step by fears, superstitions, and other unseen obstacles to action. The motto, where there's a will, there's a way, is the superstition of modern man. Yet in order to sustain his creed, contemporary man pays the price in a remarkable lack of introspection. He is blind to the fact that with all his rationality and efficiency, he is possessed by powers that are beyond his control. His gods and demons have not disappeared at all. They have merely got new names. They keep him on the run with restlessness, vague apprehensions, psychological complications, an insatiable need for pills, alcohol, tobacco, food, and, above all, a large array of neuroses. The Soul of Man what we call civilized consciousness has steadily separated itself from the basic instincts. But these instincts have not disappeared. They have merely lost their contact with our consciousness and are thus forced to assert themselves in an indirect fashion. This may be by means of physical symptoms, as in the case of a neurosis, or by means of incidents of various kinds, such as unaccountable moods, unexpected forgetfulness, or mistakes in speech. A man likes to believe that he is the master of his soul, but as long as he is unable to control his moods and emotions, or to be conscious of the myriad secret ways in which unconscious factors insinuate themselves into his arrangements and decisions, he is certainly not his own master. These unconscious factors owe their existence to the autonomy of the archetypes. Modern man protects himself against seeing his own split state by a system of compartments, Certain areas of outer life and of his own behavior are kept, as it were, in separate drawers and are never confronted with one another. As an example of this so-called compartment psychology, I remember the case of an alcoholic who had come under the laudable influence of a certain religious movement and, fascinated by its enthusiasm, had forgotten that he needed a drink. He was obviously and miraculously cured by Jesus, and he was correspondingly displayed as a witness to divine grace or to the efficiency of the said religious organization. But after a few weeks of public confessions, the novelty began to pale, and some alcoholic refreshment seemed to be indicated, and so he drank again. But this time the helpful organization came to the conclusion that the case was pathological and obviously not suitable for an intervention by Jesus, 
So they put him into a clinic to let the doctor do better than the divine healer. This is an aspect of the modern cultural mind that is worth looking into. It shows an alarming degree of dissociation and psychological confusion. If, for a moment, we regard mankind as one individual, we see that the human race is like a person carried away by unconscious powers, and the human race also likes to keep certain problems tucked away in separate drawers. But this is why we should give a great deal of consideration to what we are doing, for mankind is now threatened by self-created and deadly dangers that are growing beyond our control. Our world is, so to speak, dissociated like a neurotic, with the iron curtain marking the symbolic line of division. Western man, becoming aware of the aggressive will to power of the East, sees himself forced to take extraordinary measures of defense at the same time as he prides himself on his virtue and good intentions. What he fails to see is that it is his own vices, which he has covered up by good international manners, that are thrown back in his face by the communist world, shamelessly and methodically. What the West has tolerated, but secretly and with a sense of shame, the diplomatic lie, systematic deception, veiled threats, comes back into the open and in full measure from the East and ties us up in neurotic knots. It is the face of his own evil shadow that grins at Western man from the other side of the Iron Curtain. It is this state of affairs that explains the peculiar feeling of helplessness of so many people in Western societies. They have begun to realize that the difficulties confronting us are moral problems and that the attempts to answer them by a policy of piling up nuclear arms or by economic competition is achieving little, for it cuts both ways. Many of us now understand that moral and mental means would be more efficient since they could provide us with psychic immunity against the ever-increasing infection. End of side two. To continue, change side selector switch and turn the cassette over. Side three. Man and his symbols by Carl G. Jung. Continuing with Approaching the Unconscious on page 85. But all such attempts have proved singularly ineffective and will do so as long as we try to convince ourselves and the world that it is only they, that is, our opponents, who are wrong. It would be much more to the point for us to make a serious attempt to recognize our own shadow and its nefarious doings. If we could see our shadow, the dark side of our nature, we should be immune to any moral and mental infection and insinuation. As matters now stand, we lay ourselves open to every infection because we are really doing practically the same thing as they, only we have the additional disadvantage that we neither see nor want to understand what we ourselves are doing under the cover of good manners. The communist world, it may be noted, has one big myth, which we call an illusion, in the vain hope that our superior judgment will make it disappear. It is the time-hallowed archetypal dream of a golden age, or paradise, where everything is provided in abundance for everyone, and a great, just, and wise chief rules over a human kindergarten. This powerful archetype in its infantile form has gripped them, but it will never disappear from the world at the mere sight of our superior point of view. We even support it by our own childishness, for our Western civilization is in the grip of the same mythology. Unconsciously, we cherish the same prejudices, hopes, and expectations. We, too, believe in the welfare state, in universal peace, in the equality of man, in his eternal human rights, in justice, truth, and, do not say it too loudly, in the kingdom of God on earth. The sad truth is that man's real life consists of a complex of inexorable opposites, day and night, birth and death, happiness and misery, good and evil. We are not even sure that one will prevail against the other, that good will overcome evil or joy defeat pain. Life is a battleground. It always has been and always will be. And if it were not so, existence would come to an end. It was precisely this conflict within man that led the early Christians to expect and hope for an early end to this world, or the Buddhists to reject all earthly desires and aspirations. These basic answers would be frankly suicidal if they were not linked up with peculiar mental and moral ideas and practices that constitute the bulk of both religions and that to a certain extent modify their radical denial of the world. 
I stress this point because in our time there are millions of people who have lost faith in any kind of religion. Such people do not understand their religion any longer. While life runs smoothly without religion, the loss remains as good as unnoticed. But when suffering comes, it is another matter. That is when people begin to seek a way out and to reflect about the meaning of life and its bewildering and painful experiences. It is significant that the psychological doctor, within my experience, is consulted more by Jews and Protestants than by Catholics. This might be expected, for the Catholic Church still feels responsible for the cura animarum, the care and welfare of souls. But in this scientific age, the psychiatrist is apt to be asked the questions that once belonged in the domain of the theologian. People feel that it makes or would make a great difference if only they had a positive belief in a meaningful way of life or in God and immortality. The specter of approaching death often gives a powerful incentive to such thoughts. From time immemorial, men have had ideas about a supreme being, one or several, and about the land of the hereafter. Only today do they think they can do without such ideas. Because we cannot discover God's throne in the sky with a radio telescope, or establish for certain that a beloved father or mother is still about in a more or less corporeal form, people assume that such ideas are not true. I would rather say that they are not true enough, for these are conceptions of a kind that have accompanied human life from prehistoric times, and that still break through into consciousness at any provocation. Modern man may assert that he can dispense with them, and he may bolster his opinion by insisting that there is no scientific evidence of their truth, or he may even regret the loss of his convictions. But since we are dealing with invisible and unknowable things, for God is beyond human understanding, and there is no means of proving immortality, why should we bother about evidence? Even if we did not know by reason our need for salt in our food, we should nonetheless profit from its use. We might argue that the use of salt is a mere illusion of taste or a superstition, but it would still contribute to our well-being. Why then should we deprive ourselves of views that would prove helpful in crises and would give a meaning to our existence? And how do we know that such ideas are not true? Many people would agree with me if I stated flatly that such ideas are probably illusions. What they fail to realize is that the denial is as impossible to prove as the assertion of religious belief. We are entirely free to choose which point of view we take. It will in any case be an arbitrary decision. There is, however, a strong empirical reason why we should cultivate thoughts that can never be proved. It is that they are known to be useful. Man positively needs general ideas and convictions that will give a meaning to his life and enable him to find a place for himself in the universe. He can stand the most incredible hardships when he is convinced that they make sense. He is crushed when, on top of all his misfortunes, he has to admit that he is taking part in a tale told by an idiot. It is the role of religious symbols to give a meaning to the life of man. The Pueblo Indians believe that they are the sons of father's son, and this belief endows their life with a perspective and a goal that goes far beyond their limited existence. It gives them ample space for the unfolding of personality and permits them a full life as complete persons. Their plight is infinitely more satisfactory than that of a man in our own civilization who knows that he is and will remain nothing more than an underdog with no inner meaning to his life. A sense of a wider meaning to one's existence is what raises a man beyond mere getting and spending. If he lacks this sense, he is lost and miserable. Had St. Paul been convinced that he was nothing more than a wandering tent-maker, he certainly would not have been the man he was. His real and meaningful life lay in the inner certainty that he was the messenger of the Lord. One may accuse him of suffering from megalomania, but this opinion pales before the testimony of history and the judgment of subsequent generations. The myth that took possession of him made him something greater than a mere craftsman. Such a myth, however, consists of symbols that have not been invented consciously. They have happened. It was not the man Jesus who created the myth of the God-man. It existed for many centuries before his birth. He himself was seized by this symbolic idea, which, as St. Mark tells us, lifted him out of the narrow life of the Nazarene carpenter. Myths go back to the primitive storyteller and his dreams, to men moved by the stirring of their fantasies. 
These people were not very different from those whom later generations have called poets or philosophers. Primitive storytellers did not concern themselves with the origin of their fantasies. It was very much later that people began to wonder where a story originated. Yet, centuries ago, in what we now call ancient Greece, men's minds were advanced enough to surmise that the tales of the gods were nothing but archaic and exaggerated traditions of long-buried kings or chieftains. Men already took the view that the myth was too improbable to mean what it said. They therefore tried to reduce it to a generally understandable form. In more recent times, we have seen the same thing happen with dream symbolism. We became aware, in the years when psychology was in its infancy, that dreams had some importance. But just as the Greeks persuaded themselves that their myths were merely elaborations of rational or normal history, so some of the pioneers of psychology came to the conclusion that dreams did not mean what they appeared to mean. The images or symbols that they presented were dismissed as bizarre forms in which repressed contents of the psyche appeared to the conscious mind. It thus came to be taken for granted that a dream meant something other than its obvious statement. I have already described my disagreement with this idea, a disagreement that led me to study the form as well as the content of dreams. Why should they mean something different from their contents? Is there anything in nature that is other than it is? The dream is a normal and natural phenomenon, and it does not mean something it is not. The Talmud even says the dream is its own interpretation. The confusion arises because the dream's contents are symbolic and thus have more than one meaning. The symbols point in different directions from those we apprehend with the conscious mind, and therefore they relate to something either unconscious or at least not entirely conscious. To the scientific mind, such phenomena as symbolic ideas are a nuisance because they cannot be formulated in a way that is satisfactory to intellect and logic. They are by no means the only case of this kind in psychology. The trouble begins with the phenomenon of affect or emotion, which evades all the attempts of the psychologist to pin it down with a final definition. The cause of the difficulty is the same in both cases, the intervention of the unconscious. I know enough of the scientific point of view to understand that it is most annoying to have to deal with facts that cannot be completely or adequately grasped, the trouble with these phenomena is that the facts are undeniable and yet cannot be formulated in intellectual terms. For this, one would have to be able to comprehend life itself, for it is life that produces emotions and symbolic ideas. The academic psychologist is perfectly free to dismiss the phenomenon of emotion or the concept of the unconscious, or both, from his consideration. Yet they remain facts to which the medical psychologist, at least, has to pay due attention. For emotional conflicts and the intervention of the unconscious are the classical features of his science. If he treats a patient at all, he comes up against these irrationalities as hard facts, irrespective of his ability to formulate them in intellectual terms. It is therefore quite natural that people who have not had the medical psychologist's experience find it difficult to follow what happens when psychology ceases to be a tranquil pursuit for the scientist in his laboratory and becomes an active part of the adventure of real life. Target practice on a shooting range is far from the battlefield. The doctor has to deal with casualties in a genuine war. He must concern himself with psychic realities, even if he cannot embody them in scientific definitions. That is why no textbook can teach psychology. One learns only by actual experience. We can see this point clearly when we examine certain well-known symbols. The cross in the Christian religion, for instance, is a meaningful symbol that expresses a multitude of aspects, ideas, and emotions. But a cross after a name on a list simply indicates that the individual is dead. The phallus functions as an all-embracing symbol in the Hindu religion, but if a street urchin draws one on a wall, it just reflects an interest in his penis. Because infantile and adolescent fantasies often continue far into adult life, Many dreams occur in which there are unmistakable sexual illusions. It would be absurd to understand them as anything else. But when a mason speaks of monks and nuns to be laid upon each other, or an electrician of male plugs and female sockets, it would be ludicrous to suppose that he is indulging in glowing adolescent fantasies, 
He is simply using colorful descriptive names for his materials. When an educated Hindu talks to you about the lingam, the phallus that represents the god Shiva in Hindu mythology, you will hear things we Westerners would never connect with the penis. The lingam is certainly not an obscene illusion, nor is the cross merely a sign of death. Much depends upon the maturity of the dreamer who produces such an image. The interpretation of dreams and symbols demands intelligence. It cannot be turned into a mechanical system and then crammed into unimaginative brains. It demands both an increasing knowledge of the dreamer's individuality and an increasing self-awareness on the part of the interpreter. No experienced worker in this field will deny that there are rules of thumb that can prove helpful, but they must be applied with prudence and intelligence. One may follow all the right rules and yet get bogged down in the most appalling nonsense simply by overlooking a seemingly unimportant detail that a better intelligence would not have missed. Even a man of high intellect can go badly astray for lack of intuition or feeling. When we attempt to understand symbols, we are not only confronted with the symbol itself, but we are brought up against the wholeness of the symbol-producing individual. This includes a study of his cultural background, and in the process one fills in many gaps in one's own education. I have made it a rule myself to consider every case as an entirely new proposition about which I do not even know the ABC. Routine responses may be practical and useful while one is dealing with the surface, but as soon as one gets in touch with the vital problems, life itself takes over, and even the most brilliant theoretical premises become ineffectual words. Imagination and intuition are vital to our understanding, and though the usual popular opinion is that they are chiefly valuable to poets and artists, that in sensible matters one should mistrust them, they are in fact equally vital in all the higher grades of science. Here they play an increasingly important role which supplements that of the rational intellect and its application to a specific problem. Even physics, the strictest of all applied sciences, depends to an astonishing degree upon intuition, which works by way of the unconscious, although it is possible to demonstrate afterward the logical procedures that could have led one to the same result as intuition. Intuition is almost indispensable in the interpretation of symbols, and it can often ensure that they are immediately understood by the dreamer. But while such a lucky hunch may be subjectively convincing, it can also be rather dangerous. It can so easily lead to a false feeling of security. It may, for instance, seduce both the interpreter and the dreamer into continuing a cozy and relatively easy relation, which may end in a sort of shared dream. The safe basis of real intellectual knowledge and moral understanding gets lost if one is content with the vague satisfaction of having understood by hunch. One can explain and know only if one has reduced intuitions to an exact knowledge of facts and their logical connections. An honest investigator will have to admit that he cannot always do this, but it would be dishonest not to keep it always in mind. Even a scientist is a human being so it is natural for him, like others, to hate the things he cannot explain. It is a common illusion to believe that what we know today is all we ever can know. Nothing is more vulnerable than scientific theory, which is an ephemeral attempt to explain facts and not an everlasting truth in itself. The Role of Symbols When the medical psychologist takes an interest in symbols, he is primarily concerned with natural symbols, as distinct from cultural symbols. The former are derived from the unconscious contents of the psyche, and they therefore represent an enormous number of variations on the essential archetypal images. In many cases, they can still be traced back to their archaic roots, that is, to ideas and images that we meet in the most ancient records and in primitive societies. The cultural symbols, on the other hand, are those that have been used to express eternal truths and that are still used in many religions. They have gone through many transformations and even a long process of more or less conscious development and have thus become collective images accepted by civilized societies. Such cultural symbols nevertheless retain much of their original numinosity or spell. One is aware that they can evoke a deep emotional response in some individuals, and this psychic change makes them function in much the same way as prejudices. 
They are a factor with which the psychologist must reckon. It is folly to dismiss them because in rational terms they seem to be absurd or irrelevant. They are important constituents of our mental makeup and vital forces in the building up of human society, and they cannot be eradicated without serious loss. Where they are repressed or neglected, their specific energy disappears into the unconscious with unaccountable consequences. The psychic energy that appears to have been lost in this way in fact serves to revive and intensify whatever is uppermost in the unconscious, tendencies perhaps that have hitherto had no chance to express themselves or at least have not been allowed an uninhibited existence in our consciousness. Such tendencies form an ever-present and potentially destructive shadow to our conscious mind. Even tendencies that might in some circumstances be able to exert a beneficial influence are transformed into demons when they are repressed. This is why many well-meaning people are understandably afraid of the unconscious and, incidentally, of psychology. Our times have demonstrated what it means for the gates of the underworld to be opened, things whose enormity nobody could have imagined in the idyllic harmlessness of the first decade of our century have happened and have turned our world upside down. Ever since, the world has remained in a state of schizophrenia. Not only has civilized Germany disgorged its terrible primitivity, but Russia is also ruled by it, and Africa has been set on fire. No wonder that the Western world feels uneasy. Modern man does not understand how much his rationalism, which has destroyed his capacity to respond to numinous symbols and ideas, has put him at the mercy of the psychic underworld. He has freed himself from superstition, or so he believes, but in the process he has lost his spiritual values to a positively dangerous degree. His moral and spiritual tradition has disintegrated, and he is now paying the price for this breakup in worldwide disorientation and dissociation. Anthropologists have often described what happens to a primitive society when its spiritual values are exposed to the impact of modern civilization. Its people lose the meaning of their lives, their social organization disintegrates, and they themselves morally decay. We are now in the same condition, but we have never really understood what we have lost, for our spiritual leaders, unfortunately, were more interested in protecting their institutions than in understanding the mystery that symbols present. In my opinion, faith does not exclude thought, which is man's strongest weapon, but unfortunately many believers seem to be so afraid of science and, incidentally, of psychology that they turn a blind eye to the numinous psychic powers that forever control man's fate. We have stripped all things of their mystery and numinosity. Nothing is holy any longer. In earlier ages, as instinctive concepts welled up in the mind of man, his conscious mind could no doubt integrate them into a coherent psychic pattern. But the civilized man is no longer able to do this. His advanced consciousness has deprived itself of the means by which the auxiliary contributions of the instincts and the unconscious can be assimilated. These organs of assimilation and integration were numinous symbols held holy by common consent. Today, for instance, we talk of matter. We describe its physical properties. We conduct laboratory experiments to demonstrate some of its aspects but the word matter remains a dry, inhuman, and purely intellectual concept without any psychic significance for us. How different was the former image of matter, the great mother, that could encompass and express the profound emotional meaning of Mother Earth. In the same way, what was the spirit is now identified with intellect and thus ceases to be the father of all. It is degenerated to the limited ego thoughts of man, the immense emotional energy expressed in the image of our Father vanishes into the sand of an intellectual desert. These two archetypal principles lie at the foundation of the contrasting systems of East and West. The masses and their leaders do not realize, however, that there is no substantial difference between calling the world principle male and a father, spirit, as the West does, or female and a mother, matter, as the communists do. Essentially, we know as little of the one as of the other. In earlier times, these principles were worshipped in all sorts of rituals, which at least showed the psychic significance they held for man. But now they have become mere abstract concepts. 
As scientific understanding has grown, so our world has become dehumanized. Man feels himself isolated in the cosmos because he is no longer involved in nature and has lost his emotional unconscious identity with natural phenomena. These have slowly lost their symbolic implications. Thunder is no longer the voice of an angry god, nor is lightning his avenging missile. No river contains a spirit, no tree is the life principle of a man, no snake the embodiment of wisdom, no mountain cave the home of a great demon. No voices now speak to man from stones, plants, and animals, nor does he speak to them, believing they can hear. His contact with nature has gone, and with it has gone the profound emotional energy that this symbolic connection supplied. This enormous loss is compensated for by the symbols of our dreams. They bring up our original nature, its instincts and peculiar thinking. Unfortunately, however, they express their contents in the language of nature, which is strange and incomprehensible to us. It therefore confronts us with the task of translating it into the rational words and concepts of modern speech, which has liberated itself from its primitive encumbrances, notably from its mystical participation with the things it describes. Nowadays, when we talk of ghosts and other numinous figures, we are no longer conjuring them up. The power, as well as the glory, is drained out of such once potent words. We have ceased to believe in magic formulas. Not many taboos and similar restrictions are left and our world seems to be disinfected of all such superstitious noumena as witches, warlocks, and worrycoos, to say nothing of werewolves, vampires, bush souls, and all the other bizarre beings that populated the primeval forest. To be more accurate, the surface of our world seems to be cleansed of all superstitious and irrational elements. Whether, however, the real inner human world, not our wish-fulfilling fiction about it, is also freed from primitivity, is another question. Is the number thirteen not still taboo for many people? Are there not still many individuals possessed by irrational prejudices, projections, and childish illusions? A realistic picture of the human mind reveals many such primitive traits and survivals, which are still playing their roles just as if nothing had happened during the last five hundred years. It is essential to appreciate this point. Modern man is in fact a curious mixture of characteristics acquired over the long ages of his mental development. This mixed-up being is the man and his symbols that we have to deal with, and we must scrutinize his mental products very carefully indeed. Skepticism and scientific conviction exist in him side by side with old-fashioned prejudices, outdated habits of thought and feeling, obstinate misinterpretations, and blind ignorance. Such are the contemporary human beings who produce the symbols we psychologists investigate. In order to explain these symbols and their meaning, it is vital to learn whether their representations are related to purely personal experience or whether they have been chosen by a dream for its particular purpose from a store of general conscious knowledge. Take, for instance, a dream in which the number 13 occurs. The question is whether the dreamer himself habitually believes in the unlucky quality of the number, or whether the dream merely alludes to people who still indulge in such superstitions. The answer makes a great difference to the interpretation. In the former case, you have to reckon with the fact that the individual is still under the spell of the unlucky 13, and therefore will feel most uncomfortable in room 13 in a hotel, or sitting at a table with 13 people. In the latter case, Thirteen may not mean any more than a discourteous or abusive remark. The superstitious dreamer still feels the spell of thirteen. The more rational dreamer has stripped thirteen of its original emotional overtones. This argument illustrates the way in which archetypes appear in practical experience. They are, at the same time, both images and emotions. One can speak of an archetype only when these two aspects are simultaneous. When there is merely the image, then there is simply a word picture of little consequence. But by being charged with emotion, the image gains numinosity or psychic energy. It becomes dynamic, and consequences of some kind must flow from it. I am aware that it is difficult to grasp this concept, because I am trying to use words to describe something whose very nature makes it incapable of precise definition. 
But since so many people have chosen to treat archetypes as if they were part of a mechanical system that can be learned by rote, it is essential to insist that they are not mere names or even philosophical concepts. They are pieces of life itself, images that are integrally connected to the living individual by the bridge of the emotions. That is why it is impossible to give an arbitrary or universal interpretation of any archetype. It must be explained in the manner indicated by the whole life situation of the particular individual to whom it relates. Thus, in the case of a devout Christian, the symbol of the cross can be interpreted only in its Christian context, unless the dream produces a very strong reason to look beyond it. Even then, the specific Christian meaning should be kept in mind. But one cannot say that at all times and in all circumstances the symbol of the cross has the same meaning. If that were so, it would be stripped of its numinosity, lose its vitality, and become a mere word. Those who do not realize the special feeling tone of the archetype end with nothing more than a jumble of mythological concepts, which can be strung together to show that everything means anything or nothing at all. All the corpses in the world are chemically identical, but living individuals are not. Archetypes come to life only when one patiently tries to discover why and in what fashion they are meaningful to a living individual. The mere use of words is futile when you do not know what they stand for. This is particularly true in psychology, where we speak of archetypes such as the anima and animus, the wise man, the great mother, and so on. You can know all about the saints, sages, prophets, and other godly men, and all the great mothers of the world, but if they are mere images whose numinosity you have never experienced, it will be as if you were talking in a dream, for you will not know what you are talking about. The mere words you use will be empty and valueless. They gain life and meaning only when you try to take into account their numinosity, that is, their relationship to the living individual. Only then do you begin to understand that their names mean very little, whereas the way they are related to you is all important. The symbol-producing function of our dreams is thus an attempt to bring the original mind of man into advanced or differentiated consciousness where it has never been before and where, therefore, it has never been subjected to critical self-reflection. For in ages long past, that original mind was the whole of man's personality. As he developed consciousness, so his conscious mind lost contact with some of that primitive psychic energy and the conscious mind has never known that original mind, for it was discarded in the process of evolving the very differentiated consciousness that alone could be aware of it. Yet it seems that what we call the unconscious has preserved primitive characteristics that formed part of the original mind. It is to these characteristics that the symbols of dreams constantly refer, as if the unconscious sought to bring back all the old things from which the mind freed itself as it evolved, illusions, fantasies, archaic thought forms, fundamental instincts, and so on. This is what explains the resistance, even fear, that people often experience in approaching unconscious matters. These relict contents are not merely neutral or indifferent. On the contrary, they are so highly charged that they are often more than merely uncomfortable. They can cause real fear. The more they are repressed, the more they spread through the whole personality in the form of a neurosis. It is this psychic energy that gives them such vital importance. It is just as if a man who has lived through a period of unconsciousness should suddenly realize that there is a gap in his memory, that important events seem to have taken place that he cannot remember. Insofar as he assumes that the psyche is an exclusively personal affair, and this is the usual assumption, he will try to retrieve the apparently lost infantile memories. But the gaps in his childhood memory are merely the symptoms of a much greater loss the loss of the primitive psyche. As the evolution of the embryonic body repeats its prehistory, so the mind also develops through a series of prehistoric stages. The main task of dreams is to bring back a sort of recollection of the prehistoric, as well as the infantile world, right down to the level of the most primitive instincts. Such recollections can have a remarkably healing effect in certain cases, as Freud saw long ago. This observation confirms the view that an infantile memory gap, a so-called amnesia, represents a positive loss, and its recovery can bring a positive increase in life and well-being. 
Because a child is physically small and its conscious thoughts are scarce and simple, we do not realize the far-reaching complications of the infantile mind that are based on its original identity with the prehistoric psyche. That original mind is just as much present and still functioning in the child as the evolutionary stages of mankind are in its embryonic body. If the reader remembers what I said earlier about the remarkable dreams of the child who made a present of her dreams to her father, he will get a good idea of what I mean. In infantile amnesia, one finds strange mythological fragments that also often appear in later psychoses. Images of this kind are highly numinous and therefore very important. If such recollections reappear in adult life, they may in some cases cause profound psychological disturbance, while in other people they can produce miracles of healing or religious conversions. Often they bring back a piece of life, missing for a long time, that gives purpose to and thus enriches human life. The recollection of infantile memories and the reproduction of archetypal ways of psychic behavior can create a wider horizon and a greater extension of consciousness, on condition that one succeeds in assimilating and integrating in the conscious mind the lost and regained contents. Since they are not neutral, their assimilation will modify the personality, just as they themselves will have to undergo certain alterations. In this part of what is called the individuation process, which Dr. M. L. von Franz describes in a later section of this book, the interpretation of symbols plays an important practical role, for the symbols are natural attempts to reconcile and unite opposites within the psyche. Naturally, just seeing and then brushing aside the symbols would have no such effect and would merely reestablish the old neurotic condition and destroy the attempt at a synthesis. But unfortunately, those rare people who do not deny the very existence of the archetypes almost invariably treat them as mere words and forget their living reality. When their numinosity has thus illegitimately been banished, the process of limitless substitution begins. In other words, one glides easily from archetype to archetype, with everything meaning everything. It is true enough that the forms of archetypes are to a considerable extent exchangeable, but their numinosity is and remains a fact and represents the value of an archetypal event. This emotional value must be kept in mind and allowed for throughout the whole intellectual process of dream interpretation. It is only too easy to lose this value because thinking and feeling are so diametrically opposed that thinking almost automatically throws out feeling values and vice versa. Psychology is the only science that has to take the factor of value, that is, feeling, into account, because it is the link between physical events and life. Psychology is often accused of not being scientific on this account, but its critics fail to understand.